Luke chapter 17 is where we're going to be this morning. Luke chapter 17, starting with verse 20. And I'm just going to read through it all the way through just so we can, can marinate on it, get it in our heart, get it in our soul. And then we'll start walking through the verses. Luke 17, 20. Now, when he was asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, he answered them and said, The kingdom of God does not come with observation, nor will they say, See here or see there, for indeed the kingdom of God is within you. Then he said to the disciples, The days will come when you will desire to see one of the days of the Son of Man, and you will not see it. And they will say to you, look here, or look there. Do not go after them or follow them. For as the lightning that flashes out of one part under heaven shines to the other part under heaven also, so also the Son of Man will be in his day. But first he must suffer many things and be rejected by this generation. And as it was in the days of Noah, so it will be in the days of the Son of Man. They ate, they drank, they married wives. They were given the marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. Likewise, as it was also in the days of Lot, they ate, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they built. But on the day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Even so will it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. In that day, he who is on the housetop and his goods are in the house, let him not come down to take them away. Likewise, the one who is in the field, let him not turn back. Remember Lot's wife. Whoever seeks to save his life will lose it. And whoever loses his life will preserve it. I tell you, in that night there will be two men in one bed, and one will be taken, and the other will be left. Two women will be grinding together. One will be taken, and the other left. Two men will be in the field. One will be taken, and the other left. And they answered and said to him, Where, Lord? And he said to them, Wherever the body is, there the eagles will be gathered together. What a passage, huh? How pertinent for today. You know, it starts talking about the desire, those who desire the day of the Lord and will not see it. You know, part of that's what grabbed me as I'm, I'm looking at this passage. I think many of us are in that position, aren't we? We're starting to watch our world and we're watching the devastation, destruction of morality and, and just the life that we know. Um, and we go, man, Lord, I desire your day. I desire for you to come and make things right. I desire for your justice. This really resonates with our soul. As I was looking at this passage, I noticed some people in this passage I identified them. I labeled them. You can see if my label is any good or not. First of all, we see watchers. Watchers, it's the one who wants to see. They want proof. They're critics, judgmental, but they're uninvolved. They're standing in the back. They're in the back corner, and they're just watching with a critical heart, critical mind. And Scripture says they also make excuses. Interesting. We say that in the, in the Pharisees, specifically in this passage. Another group of people we see are chasers. They're different. They're quick to follow. But what are they following? Their own desires, ultimately, and what is seen. So someone or something, they see it, they resonate with it, they identify with it, and boom! They're after it because it connects with that which their heart already wants. And we know about that in James, don't we? It's called temptation. And Jesus talks about that. We'll see it here in a minute. He says, don't follow them. Interesting. We have chasers. 
often swayed by others, usually immature disciples. Good people, nature, good-natured in their hearts, really ultimately, you know, wanting to serve the Lord, but they become immature and they start seeing something that looks like maybe Christ or good or whatever. And next thing you know, they're way out there. I think we all know them, don't we? I mean, we've met people who started coming to church and started getting excited about Jesus. And now, you know, how many years ever later, they're talking about there's many ways to heaven. What happened from that moment when they started getting soft hearts? They were chasers. They chased after ultimately something that was in their own soul, their own desire. They really didn't want Jesus Christ. They wanted a Christ. They wanted a Messiah that they wanted rather than Jesus himself. Chasers. There's ignorers. Man, that's an easy one, isn't it? Just put on the blinders, look forward, do your job, ignore everything else. They ignore. They said, I don't know. Chose not to pay attention. Interesting, who are these people in this passage? We see they are the ones who were watching the ark be built. They were the ones who said, wow, he's building something crazy. And they heard the preacher. Something's going to happen. And they went, yeah, might happen. Too busy. Ignorers. Ignorance by choice. We say ignorers. Turn backers. They tried it. Moved on. It was just a phase. You know, hey, I'm going to follow this. Oh, hey, let's try it out. You know, I tried Christianity once, and I really didn't like it because it didn't really do much for me. Like you just come on Sunday for an hour and a half, and you go home. Turn backers. Pretty soon, they're like, why? COVID hits. Turn backer. Like, I think I'll stay home. There's no reason for me to go back to church because there wasn't a connection with Christ in their heart and their life. They were doing it for whatever reason, but they really were a turn backer, and we see that in Lot's wife. Self-preservers. Wow, here we go. This is right down our alley here in the United States of America, isn't it? Western culture, Europe. Preserve yourself. Save yourself. Really. No one else is going to save you. You save yourself. You know, however that looks. In, in a conservative setting, it's build your bunker. Right? Build your bunker. Bury it. Shove stuff in it and save yourself. Maybe in a uh, more, more city type setting, it's you know, become the top of your job and make a lot of money and have all these things. Preserve, make it, make it your own way. But it can, it can show up in many different ways, but it's self-preservation. We see that here as well. I'm ultimately going to do what's best for me, and I'm going to be my own Savior. I don't need you, and I don't need Christ. Interesting. We'll see these people in this passage. We see clingers, passionate, clinging, holding, strong grip. But what are they clinging to? In this passage, they're clinging to the world, that which they think will bring them satisfaction. They're clinging. They're often a self-preserver as well. Then we have lifers. This makes me smile. Lifers. Jesus talks about them. They're the ones who are born again. They are ones who are lifers because they have life. They are alive. They have zoe. They have spiritual life in Christ. Lifers. This is what we want to be. A lifer. Not just for temporary, not a turn backer, but someone who says, I have the life of Christ within me, and therefore I can live in this world in a way that changes things. It helps. And this is what these brothers are doing here. Because of Christ in their life, and a few sisters as well. They are being lifers. They are saying, I have life of Christ in me. I have resources. I'm going to go offer that to someone who doesn't have it. Pray for them. Then there's a loser. And we go, oh, yeah. I know some of those losers, right? Man, that guy's a loser, and she's a loser. Look at all these losers. But in this passage, there's a little bit of a different meaning there. Jesus says, the loser is the one who gives up his life for me. He's the one, which is a true disciple of Christ. He's the one who says, Lord, Lord, 
and does what he says. He's a loser. He has lost his life for the sake of Christ. This is who we want to be. These are the people that I see in this passage. Hopefully you can see them too. Now we look at verse 20. We see here, there's a question. Question by the Pharisees. Now we've identified, I've identified, I've labeled, if you will, the Pharisees as watchers, ones who are watching. And they asked a question. When the kingdom of God would come, in verse 20, Jesus answered and said to them, the kingdom of God does not come with observation, nor will they say, see here or see there, for indeed the kingdom of God is within you. Interesting question. But the, the, the setting of this, we go all the way back to chapter 14, we see Jesus, he starts out going into the house of one of the rulers of the Pharisees to eat bread on the Sabbath. So he's hanging out with the religious, not just the religious, the important religious, the ones who you would, you know, the uh, Pope, if you will. These, these religious people who are lofty and high. And he walks in this house and he's sitting down and he's eating with them. Interesting because we will see in chapter 15 who he ends up eating with, the sinners. There's a movement of Jesus from that which is in the lofty place, which he is trying to reach these guys and trying to, to explain to them who he really is. And they're really asking, who, when is the kingdom coming? Are you really the Messiah? Is really the question they're trying to ask um, because they don't see it and they don't like what they see if it's true. And so they're looking at Jesus and they're looking at what they have learned and they're looking at the criteria they have in their heart and their mind and their observation as observers say, that is not what the Messiah is. That's not. And this is not the kingdom of God, not realizing that in the process they were denying the very truth that was in front of them. So Jesus sits down with them in chapter 14, eating bread. They're having this discussion. Jesus has moved with compassion in chapter 14 by a man with dropsy, the scripture calls it. And Jesus reaches out and touches him and he's healed in the Pharisee's house. Their response, we know what their response their response. Of an of a observer, of a watcher, as always, what are you doing? It's the Sabbath. It's the Shabbat. You know we don't do that on the Shabbat? They had no concern for the man with dropsy. They were upset about what he had did. He did work on the Shabbat, and he's, they're all upset. Jesus is like, wow, come on, guys. You're wanting to know about the kingdom. You're talking about eating bread on the, uh, uh, in the kingdom of God, etc." So they go into some table talk. Now we're, we're moving through 14 just to give us some, some context. They're sitting around the table and Jesus is talking to them. So he says, you know, let me tell you some stories. So Jesus starts telling them some stories so they can start understanding what, why he's there and what his purpose is. He talks about who you invite to the table. When you come to the table, do you sit next to the important guy? Well, the setting was they were all important people and they're all trying to be more important. So they're trying to outsit each other. Like, if I get in that seat before he does, then maybe I'll be able to sit there and be important. And so they're fighting over seats, and Jesus is talking about what he saw, and he's illustrating, and we know that he says, you know, sit away from the most important person. And if that most important person invites you, then you're honored. But if you sit next to him and he moves you away, now the reality of who you really are comes out, and you don't really want that, do you? Jesus tells that story. Then he goes to the next story. He talks about there's an invitation, there's a feast, and invite all these people. And he had, and we just think of the wedding yesterday that we were a part of, all the invitation, all the effort, and imagine all of that happening, and no one show up. This is the story Jesus is telling. No one's there. Nothing's going on. And so he goes, well, tell him again. So tell him again, no one comes. So he's like, well, find somebody. I think there's probably someone over there who wants to eat something. And we got food, so bring them. So he tells this story, and what do we hear him say at the end of the story? He talks about the ones who ended up at the table were who? The poor, the maimed, the lame, and the blind. Those are the ones who ended up at the table. It wasn't the, the proud and the rich. It wasn't the watchers. It wasn't the observers. It wasn't the ones who said, hey, prove to me that you're a Messiah. It was the ones who said, man, I want food. I don't know who you are, but there is food and I want it. And this is what's happening over there. 
People are saying, man, I want food. When we were in Israel, that's what happened. I don't know. It used to be a barrier. You couldn't talk about Jesus. Now we're sharing the gospel with these people that would never, ever heard it before. Why? Because they're hungry all of a sudden. Hunger. We just want food. So Jesus tells that parable. And it's really interesting. The response of the Pharisee as they're kicked back. And they're having heard Jesus tell these stories. This man was drops, he was healed. And they're contemplating these great theological concepts. He says this, this Pharisee. Blessed is he who eats bread in the kingdom of God. And you can just see him sitting there. You know, we were, when we were standing at the Temple Mount, those proud people, right? Those, those rabbis with their hat. And you don't dare touch them. You know, you don't dare run off with their scroll, Right? <laughs> they're, they're proud. And they're like, man, isn't this great? If it was, everything was just like this, where we sat at a table like this with all of these high important people and we sat and ate bread in the kingdom of God. Jesus had just showed them who was going to be there. It was going to be the poor and the main and the hungry. It was going to be those people that were going to be at the table because the others were too busy to show up. Jesus patiently responds, 14, a certain man gave a great supper, invited many, and sent his servant at supper time to say to those who were invited, come. And what, in verse 18, what happened? They all with one accord began to make excuses. So the observers were the one who were making excuses. And this is what we see. So we have, this is the context. We're talking about the kingdom of God. A couple of things happen, go on, more activities. But this is what was laid before we get to 17. This discussion of the kingdom of God. And now he's asking a different Pharisee, it seems, at a different location, different time. Kind of the same question. And what is he saying? When? When is the kingdom of God coming? And clearly, it's a question because he doesn't see it in Jesus. Because he doesn't see what he believes should be there in order for the kingdom of God to be present. What did they believe? What do they believe today? These are things they believe today. They believe that the ruler of the Jew, that, that when the Messiah comes, he will be the ruler of the Jewish people as their king, an actual king. They believe that he will remove oppressors militarily. They believe the descendant. He's going to be a descendant of King David. He's going to be um, wise and righteous. He's going to be human, fully human. In fact, they believe that um, there are many people who have the potential to be a Messiah at any given time should Yahweh anoint them to do so. So it's not just one particular specific person. It's the one who gets the nod by Yahweh. But it's a man, and he will perform miracles. So they're looking. They got one miracles. The rest doesn't fit. He's not a military guy. He's not going to free them from the Romans. He's, um, there's just nothing about him that indicates he's the Messiah. He would help. What would he do? He would help restore the world into a utopian state. Jewish people will be reunited into their homeland. The temple will be rebuilt, built and functioning. Peace in the homeland, they'll see. Jews will become an example, a light to the nations. Oh, isn't that great for those Pharisees? We're at the top of the Jewish pile. And at the top of the Jewish pile, when the Messiah comes in, we're going to be the example to the nations. We, us, me. They're not seeing that in Jesus. Jesus is not moving that direction for them. He's calling them vipers and all these other things. They're like, whoa, we're going downhill. This is not what we see. We should be up, going up. You know, in importance. The teachings of the Torah will be spread to the whole world. Ultimately, the world comes to accept one God and universal peace reigns throughout the world. That's what they believe. That's what they're waiting for now. Universal peace throughout the world. They didn't realize that the Prince of Peace was standing in front of them. And they missed it. They were observing. But he said, you won't see it with observation. Because the kingdom of God is... Within you. Now, wait a minute. That's interesting. How can the kingdom of God be within the Pharisees? See, this is, this is a translation thing. If you start really looking into it, it's like, well, he couldn't be clearly talking about the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. 
Because at that point in time, Jesus had not died and resurrected. He hadn't set the Holy Spirit. It couldn't be in their hearts. It was among them. And so that's what he was trying to say. The kingdom of God is within you, but he's talking about really being among you if you really want to study that out. But it's interesting because we have some other verses that um, speak to this as well, right? Um, we know that Jesus was not talking about the kingdom of God being inside the Pharisees' hearts because Romans 10, 9 through 10 says, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. They had not and will not and were not doing that. They did not believe he was the Messiah. So that couldn't be what it means. In Romans 8, 9, but you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if indeed the spirit of God dwells in you. So if the kingdom of God would have been inside of them and they would have had the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, they would have been saved. They were not. So it can't be. Jesus was not their Lord. He had not died and resurrected. They couldn't confess it. How do we understand this? Let's look at Nicodemus. Nicodemus, Pharisee and ruler of the Jews, remember, he approached Jesus at night. He acknowledged Jesus was from God. Jesus tells him this in John 3, 3. One cannot see the kingdom of God unless born, you're born again. What did Jesus say? It doesn't come by observation. Read again what, what he said to Nicodemus. One cannot see the kingdom of God unless you're born again. The friends that you have, the people that you know, they cannot see. They are observing as hard as they want to see, but they can't see it. Why? Because they're not born again. This is our dilemma as people of Christ. To help them see that they need to be born again so they can really then start to see the kingdom of God. These Pharisees were trying to see it without being born again. Not going to happen. And so sometimes we're like, God, what are you doing? I don't see it. Maybe people will ask you, why, why? I don't see what you're saying. They're not born again. Jesus says in John 3, 5, one cannot enter the kingdom of God unless one is born of water and of spirit. How important is it to be born again? If you're here today and you're not born again and you say, I don't see the kingdom of God, that's why. I invite you, be born again. Ask the Lord to forgive your sins. Make him be Lord of your life. Very important. Don't just be an observer. So in order to truly see the kingdom of God, one must be spiritually reborn and make Jesus king of their life, become part of his kingdom, be a lifer. So that's my challenge to us. That's our, that's our challenge to us is are we a lifer? Not in word, I'm a Christian, but in reality. I am a born again lifer who sees the kingdom of God, not just what is going on currently. And one of the reasons why we are so frustrated and depressed as Christians with what's going on is we have stopped looking for the kingdom of God, where he is doing things and what he's doing. Instead, we're focusing on that which is not of God, and it's very disturbing to us, rightly so. But the kingdom of God is among you. The kingdom of God is, for those, is seen by those who are born again. You are born again. Let's look for his kingdom. Let's be a part of it. Let's be a lifer. Verse 22, then he said to the disciples, said to the disciples, the days will come when you will desire to see one of the days of the Son of Man and you will not see it. They will say to you, look here, look there. Do not go after them or follow them. For those who are looking for the kingdom of God, and they're not seeing it, we have to ask the question, are they born again? And if they're not born again, it's so easy for them to follow somewhere else. And some of these people that we see, you know, you, you talk about the seed and the, the sower, and the sower went out to sow, and the, sow, the seed was cast, and then the bird came and stole it. That's a, that's a challenge that we go, wow, this person, he, they showed up to church and they, were, they, were, they, they attended for three months and, and they, they started talking spiritual things and, and what happened to them? They're gone and now they don't believe it anymore. They're really a chaser. They're a person who 
saw something new, something else, something with more promise because they couldn't see the kingdom of God because they weren't born again. And they said, maybe this is the thing. And they chased it instead. And Jesus was telling his disciples, don't be that person. Interesting that it's his disciples he's telling that to. The application context is for us, isn't it? Be careful what you chase. Because you desire the kingdom of God so much and you want the day of the Son of Man to come, don't let that passion desire cause you to chase something that's not from him. Be careful. There are so many teachers out there teaching heresy. Be careful. Don't chase them. Follow the word of God. Follow what Jesus said. Jesus says, just because you desire his kingdom to come, don't go chasing people who call themselves Jesus, or who say, I have the way, or who have these secret ways to, to, to the Lord. Don't follow that. And those, if you have friends and family who are doing that, help them not to be a chaser. Of course, we know son of man is the term that was used. Jesus was saying something really important here. He was calling himself God, and that comes out of Daniel 7. We don't have time this morning to cover that. But for those of you who really want to dig deep, you've, you've heard teaching on this before, and it's super amazing and super in-depth of Jesus calling himself the Son of Man and the significance of that. He was, but in essence, saying, I am God. So I commend that study to you if you have the time and the desire. Jesus said three things. In that passage of 22 and 23, you will desire to see, and you will not see. You will desire to see, and you will not see. And then he said, don't follow them. What they're following was what they wanted to see, really. They were looking for the answer, and they thought they maybe saw it in Jesus. And then they really didn't see it in Jesus because they weren't functioning under spiritual eyes as born-again believers, and they saw this that would actually meet their need, and they followed it instead. And how much do we see that in our own lives, that we chase that which is not really the answer? Big question. We chase our, chase our own safety or, or chase some theological idea that we like that really isn't of Christ at all. Matthew says it this way, same kind of passage, uh, 24, 23 through 26. If anyone says to you, here is the Christ, or there, do not believe it, for false Christs and false prophets will rise and show great signs and wonders to deceive. Signs and wonders to deceive. Just because they're doing signs and wonders does not mean that they're the Christ. Or that they have the answer. There are signs and wonders that are happening that are not from God. Jesus is here, himself says it right here. They will show great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. See, I have told you beforehand. Isn't that the grace of God? He tells us beforehand. We go, oh, wait a minute. I better test that and see if that's of Christ. Don't just go chase it. He said, don't go chase it. He's telling all of these things to his disciples beforehand. So they will stay on the path. Stay steady. You're not seeing what you think you want to see. Look deeper. Look for the kingdom of God. 1 John 4, 1 through 3 tells us to test the spirits, whether they are of God. Many false prophets have gone out into the world. 2 Peter 21 tells us that there's going to be false prophets among the people, even false teachers among you. That's what we have to be careful of. It's not the one who's outside. It's the one that's among us that is teaching false truths. So we, this is why we need the scriptures so desperately that we compare what is being taught to the word of God. Secretly bringing in destructive heresies. This is, this is the intention. And we follow them because the Bible tells us we want them because they meet our fleshly desires. So make sure, we need to make sure that our desires are for Christ. It's because there will be something that's coming along that's an imitation of Christ. It's an imitation of that which is true. And you will want it because it matches the desire that you have that is not yet sanctified. 
Sanctify yourself with the Lord in His Word, by the Holy Spirit, in prayer, in study, so that you will not be drawn away by evil desires. Verse 24, so as the, for as the lightning that flashes out of the one part of heaven, let's start over. For as the lightning that flashes out of one part under heaven shines to the other part under heaven, so also the Son of Man will be in his day. This made me happy because we're like, wow, you know, the question is, when's the kingdom of God going to come? How will we know? And Jesus gives us a real comparison, right? Simile. Like lightning. Think about that. Do we have, I mean, does the lightning here in Oregon, Camas Valley, Oregon, or Douglas County compare to Kansas? <laughs> You've seen it, right? I mean, here it's like, you know, one little flash out of a cloud, and, you know, if you missed it, you missed it. Out there, you can't help. It's just like, this is the analogy that Jesus is drawing on. You know that a single lightning flash occurred in Uruguay, northern Argentina, on 18th of June in 2020, lasted for 17 seconds. It's the longest one ever recorded. Imagine a 17-second lightning bolt. Unbelievable. The average lightning bolt is 0.2 seconds long. So think of that one. That was, um, you imagine that. I mean, everyone must have thought they were dead. What a crazy moment. The longest lightning flash that they've been able to measure has a distance, a horizontal distance of 477 miles. That's equivalent of distance of New York City to Columbus, Ohio. One unbroken bolt. The eye can only see three miles away standing on the ground because of the curvature of the earth. How many of you watched a meteor shower last, the other night, last few nights? You watched a meteor shower, anybody? Did you see it? Was it just my wife and I and a couple of other people laying in a field? Come on. I wouldn't have been there except my wife's like, hey, meteor shower, come watch. I'm laying there going, what am I looking at? And then she's like, oh, there goes one. I'm like, you're just saying that. There goes another one. Oh, you're just saying that. So they become a competition. We're going to count. Of course, I started counting after they'd already seen more than me. And then I started winning and I left. So I could win. And then they saw the Aurora Borealis, so I missed that. Your eye is an amazing in light, right? At nighttime, when you're looking at the stars, how far away is the light that you're seeing to? This is the analogy that Jesus is drawing on. We're not going to have to guess when he comes. When the day of the Lord comes, it's going to be like that. It's going to be across the sky Everyone knows, here it is, bright as can be. It's not going to be like, I missed it. What was that? It's going to be something that everyone's going to see. That was a comfort to my soul. Because as the world gets darker, you begin to wonder. Jesus very clearly says, don't worry about that. Don't follow them. Don't follow them. Follow them. When I show up, you're going to see it as it from the sky for miles around. And then everyone's going to see it. It's going to illuminate everything. No one's going to miss it. Comforted my soul. Verse 25. But first, there's always a first. But first, he must. What must he do? Oh. Looks like there's always a suffering first. You know, my wife's involved in birth. There's always a suffering first, helping people be, you know, little children come into the world, babies come into the world. There's always a suffering first. Before the joy, there's always a suffering. Before this amazing return where lightning flashes across the sky that we all long for, there's always a suffering. But this suffering is specific to one individual, Jesus Christ, for our soul. What hope is that? Because if he did not suffer first, then when that lightning came, that as lightning came, it's not going to be real lightning, right? It's as lightning. When that came, we would be damned. We would be judged. But first he would suffer and die and pay the price. So now when that comes, we are going to be saved. Salvation is going to come because of this suffering. 
He's going to be suffer. He's going to suffer and be rejected. Verse twenty six. And it was in the day of Noah. It will also be in the days of the Son of Man. They ate. They drank. They married wives. They were given in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark and flood came and destroyed them all. This is, uh, you know, and then in in the next section, it talks about Lot and what happened with Lot. Um, This, I've often heard this taught, you know, they're partying, you know, Noah's out there working his tail off. Oh, I got to build this thing. And everyone's like, hey, I don't think that's what I read here. I mean, count me, you know, check me out on this. What'd they do? Ate? Well, that's what you and I do. (laughs) Drank? Well, that's, you know, water or whatever. You know, it doesn't necessarily say they drank alcohol, so it doesn't necessarily indicate it was a party. They were doing function of life. What's the next thing? They married. They were marrying. Okay, until what? The judgment came. This is the one that we were talking about in terms of ignoring. There is that which you see, knowing it's coming. Jesus has told us it's coming. He's saying, I have first yet to die so that you will be saved when I come. And you're going to, everyone's going to see it. Do you understand that? The kingdom of God is within at the moment, but when it comes, you will see it and you will know it. Are you ready for that? Or will you be eating, drinking, marrying, distracted? Ignoring, trying to ignore that which is coming. Well, with Noah, judgment came through a flood, and what was the result? How many were destroyed? All. With Lot, how did it come? How did it come? Through fire. And how many were destroyed? All. We have this two stories. Jesus is using a repetition here. To really make an impression upon us that says that there is going to be destruction for all those who are not in the plan of Jesus Christ. This wasn't just destruction. All were destroyed except for Noah and his family. All were destroyed except for Lot. Now His wife had the potential of salvation, but she turned back. Turning back. Matthew 24, 36 through 39 tells us, but of that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, but my father only. But as the days of Noah were, so also were the coming of son of man be. For as in the days before the flood, they were eating, drinking, marrying, giving a marriage until the day Noah entered the ark. And they did not know until the flood came. How can you not know? You had, you had an ark, you had a preacher of righteousness, you had rain. You didn't know. You're ignorant. Willful choice of ignorance. Let's not be that person. Ignorers. Verse 28. Talking about Lot. Now the difference here with Lot's list is what do we have? They ate, they drank, a couple of extra things. They bought and sold business. They planted and they built. Uh (laughs) Uh-oh. Farmers. This is, you know, they planted and they built. You know, carpenters, contractors, business people, just doing, living their life. But this time it says the fire and brimstone came from heaven. Interesting. They were living, they were enjoying the things of the flesh. They're ignoring God and his prophecies. They ignored that the pending judgment was coming. They ignored that there was a salvation and a savior. They willfully embraced judgment, claiming to be ignorant without the right to really be ignorant. Romans 14, 17 says this, for the kingdom of God is not, you know it, eating and drinking but righteousness and peace in the Holy Spirit. The kingdom of God is not eating and drinking. They were looking for the kingdom of God. They wanted peace in their meal and their food and their meal plan and, and their, the, you know, the Romans to be gone. And that, they were looking at all these things. It says it's not those things. What is it? Righteousness. Can't see it. Peace. Can't see it. 
joy in the Holy Spirit. You can only see it when it flows out of someone's life, which is what we're supposed to be. Even so it will be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. So we have Lot's wife. She's an example. Verse 31, In that day he who is on the housetop and his goods are in the house, let him not come down and take them away. Don't love your things so much that when time comes that you go run to your things rather than to the Lord. Run to the Lord rather than your things. Run to the Lord better, but rather than what you've provided for yourself. Run to the Lord rather than things of this earth. Run to the Lord. That's what he's saying. And likewise, one who is in the field, let him not turn back. Remember Lot's wife. Turn backers. Whoever, we, we've memorized this, right? Whoever what? Seeks to save his life will lose it. And whoever loses his life will preserve it. This is an interesting um, sentence that we have. The word there literally is the word lose. I, I don't know. I don't, I don't know that I like this translation very well. It comes from polymai. You guys know, remember Pilgrim's Progress? And there was a monster that Christian had to fight. Remember what his name was? Apollyon. The destroyer. That's really what it is. This isn't, you know, salvation falls out of your back pocket or your life falls out of your pocket. Whoever seeks to save his life will have it fall out of his back pocket. You don't lose it. How do you lose your life? According to here, whoever seeks to save his life will destroy it. Self-destruction. You try to save your life yourself. You, you do not turn to Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. You will destroy your own life. You will destroy your own life. And he's saying here, but whoever loses his life will preserve it. What, let's put the word back in there because it's the same word. Whoever destroys his life will live. Literally is what it says. If you destroy your life, you will live. Now, what? that's craziness. Craziness. Destroy my life? Yes. The temple that you have built up for yourself. The place that you've put, your in, put yourself in as the king of your own life must be destroyed. And you must destroy it. And let him be king and lord of your life. That is the only way that you will see and know and walk in the kingdom of God. The only way. If you think that you're going to hang on to this world and hang on to its things, and you're just going to, that's going to be your focus. You're going to actually destroy your own life. Jesus here is calling today, wherever you are, even those who are his disciples, he's saying, you must let me be on the throne, but you first have to destroy your own throne that you've made for yourself. Super challenging to myself because thrones can look different, right? Some of them can be religious, religious thrones. The Pharisees were on a religious throne. Some can be, you know, sports. Could be whatever your throne is for yourself. It's time to let the Lord have your life entirely. At the end, we have the loser. The one who says, I'm going to die to myself. I'm going to let Jesus be Lord. And I'm going to embrace sozo true life, life of Christ. So for those of us who are looking for him to come and we're not seeing it and we have frustration in our life and our heart, I would say press in to the Savior. Make sure you're not on the throne of your life trying to solve your own problems. Crawl off that throne again and let him back up on the throne of your life. Be a lifer. Be a loser. Destroy your life so that he can build his throne again on your life. It doesn't matter whether, how long you've sat in this congregation. It doesn't matter whether you have a title elder or not. It doesn't matter whether you're a Sunday school teacher. We all find ourselves having put ourselves back in that place again. And Jesus says, you want to see the kingdom? You want to be encouraged? You want to know that I am with you? 
You want to have the peace of the kingdom of God in your life? Let me be your Lord again. Lord, we come to you this morning. What an encouraging thing, Lord, to know that you are so gracious to us. You are so kind to us. And Lord, as you're talking to the disciples, as you're talking to the Pharisees, you're reminding them what your kingdom is, and it's so different than the way we see it. And Lord, we need your eyes to see your kingdom, to understand your word, to be transformed by you, to let you be on the throne of our life, not to try to save ourselves. Lord, may we not just be watchers who sit back, critical, don't act, point at other Christians or their flaws or other people and their problems and never enter into sozo. Lord, may we not be chasers, ones who run after other things because this one, we didn't wait long enough to really see you, to know you. May we not be ignorer, burying our head in the sand and saying, I just don't want to see it, la, 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 la. Or may we not turn back. But I pray for everyone here that they will follow you all of the days of their life, that they will not turn back from you claiming that you did not satisfy. But I pray they would not be self-preservers. We would not be self-preservers trying to save ourselves. May we not be clingers, Lord, clinging to this world. May we be those who give you full reign of our life. May we be lifers. May we lose. May we destroy the things in our life that oppose you and let you be Lord. Thank you, Lord, in your name. Amen.